Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we'll be looking primarily at verses 14 to 16, but to give us the whole context, we're going to read uh, the first 16 verses. And I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful, scheme, deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of God. Thanks be to him. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would give us grace, that we would attend your word, that we would not be distracted by the things of this world, but that you, by your spirit, would hone our attention, that we would see you, and know you that we would truly understand that the Lord is God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In a letter dated February 10th, 2019, this was written. I found many old VHS, for those of you under 40, ask somebody over. I found many old VHS tapes recently and wanted to see what is on them and realized I had no player. So I went to eBay for the first time and discovered your offer. I bought your VHS, he means VH, uh, VCR, but... We'll be okay with that. I bought your VHS, and you shipped it within a few days. The VHS looks new and unused. Amazing. I had some issues getting it going, which were mine and not the player. I am 86, and perhaps not up to my game, but I do get there eventually. And I did, and discovered the VHS works perfectly. Thank you, for your, thank you so much for your care, your efforts, and your promptness. I watched tapes of my retirement party from 25 years ago, which I had never seen before. We were young. Then a tape of my wedding with all the family and friends, many of which are no longer around. Then skiing trips, kids growing up, travels, and most importantly, the, the gentle maturing of my family. Each one more fun than the last. All thanks to your generous selling of the VHS player. I thought you would appreciate how much someone has enjoyed your offer. 
This is a letter of appreciation. It really is meant to be a letter of encouragement. One that is saying, yes, I bought this from you, but I want you to know what the benefit of it was for me. It should be no surprise that as we look around in this world that we would see encouragement. Uh, And in a very real sense, we could spend a lot of time focusing on how do we encourage each other better that we would feel uh, a nice warmth inside. In fact, that's what the world really is, has as a goal of its encouragement. We don't have to scratch too much to find out that the encouragements that are offered in this world are really geared towards the self-affirmed pleasure of the one receiving the encouragement. Or maybe the feelings of the one that is seeking to be encouraged. And those are not evil things. It is good to say, I see that you are struggling and that you are uh, having a difficult time. Let me give you some encouragement. Let me uh, give you something that would be uh, helping you with the, the pleasure that you are missing out on that you have identified in yourself. But as we see the world through the lens of the gospel, even this morning, we see that there are many that are seeking to to encourage one another in things that are really not of God. Those self-described things that that I say, "This this is me, this is who I am, and so then we, as the world around, need to seek how to encourage that one in whatever they have identified for themselves that needs encouragement. That's the goal of this world. It's it's to be kind. Again, there's nothing wrong with that letter that I wrote, but that's a perfect example of how to encourage in this world. I just want you to know that you were noticed, that there was something that good that happened, and it ends there. But you and I who are in Christ have a much different goal. Uh, there, are, there are everyday goals that, that happen within our, our lives as far as uh, encouragement is concerned. There are things that we get discouraged in, and so we need to be encouraged in those daily cares, in those daily things when we have questions that arise. But why are we encouraging? What are we seeking to accomplish? And so this morning, in the time that we have, I want us to be thinking and considering what is your goal as you seek to encourage, especially a brother and sister in Christ. But we'll see that encouragement can be sent out and be given to those that are not of Christ as well. What is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? What good are you trying to work And this is a language that maybe our world can understand very well. We want a good. We just don't agree on what the definition of good is. Coming from Scripture, we have a very clear definition of what good is. And the good of this world can change on a dime. Overnight. So when we think about encouragement, and especially we're going to be looking about the, the, uh, the outward encouragement, uh, how we encourage others, uh, what we're looking to do, but we also need to be considering what we are looking for when we want to be encouraged, because this is a two-way street. Uh, there are things that people say that are sincere, that are beneficial, and that are godly and from God's word, but yet we don't receive them well because we want something else. So from both of those sides this morning, let us consider together what the goal of encouragement is. Uh, We can't really know the goal of encouragement until we know the goal of our very existence. And so, as a test this morning, the goal... Uh, as we identify it in our midst this morning, could be also understood as the chief end. So let me ask you, people of God, what is the chief end of man? You were were getting there. I I think everybody said it. Let's do it one more time. People of God, what is the chief end of man? Amen. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. 
That's our starting point. That's, that's where we're going with this all. If there's nothing else um, that, we, that, that you're able to, to take away or that, that kind of registers in your brain, may the Holy Spirit work more in you this morning that your chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Notice forever is not just this world. But we'll get to that in a minute. So that's the, the first question of the, the catechism, Westminster Shorter Confession. But what, how does that relate to Ephesians chapter 4? Especially the verses 14 to 16, as we have set up for us this morning. Uh, before we get there, let me just bring us up to speed where we've been in Ephesians so far. If you've been reading through and, and studying through the, the, the letter to the church in Ephesus, you will notice that Paul doesn't really know them all that well. In fact, he's heard of their faith. He wants to encourage them in their faith, and so he sends them this letter. Ephesians has the distinction of being an, an extremely positive letter from a human standpoint uh, because we identify it as Paul doesn't get into the taking the Ephesians out to the woodshed moments that he gets into other letters. So he's teaching them, and he's encouraging them, and he's pointing out to them how you then should walk. In the context of chapter 4, he has just completed highlighting and, and even highlighting the prayer that he has for them that they would know the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ. And so in chapter 4, he turns his attention and says, now that you, uh, I've prayed that for you, let me tell you this. You need to be unified in your diversity and be mature. That would be the overview of chapter 4. You need to be unified even though you are parts of the body and you need to be mature. As we turn then to verse 14, we understand the goals, the first goal of Christian encouragement is to be planted. As he's talking about in context of being unified, of understanding what it is to live for Christ as the body. This is not just for us to take as individuals and then kind of run with it and say, this is, this is for me. I'm going to go off in the woods someplace and I'm going to work this uh, and see what happens. No, this is for the body of Christ. You, if you have confessed faith in Jesus Christ, are a part of the body You've been born into the body of Christ. And so the first goal of our encouragement, which we see in the goal of, of what Paul is calling the Ephesians to, is that of being planted. He says to them, so that we may no longer be children. Uh, the NIV here gives us a little bit more direction as far as uh, a new sentence and says, then we will no longer be infants. Because of what has gone before, that you are, you have become mature and attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. If you are mature and have attained the whole measure of Christ, then you will no longer be tossed. You will no longer be moved back and forth, to and fro by the waves. Now, so Paul is, is highlighting that Challenges are certain. You need to be planted because challenges are certain. There is a guarantee that you will have challenges, that you will have trials, that you will have uh, things that come into your life because of being a follower of Christ, because of being in Christ Jesus, having died to yourself and living in Christ. What he's calling them to is to not ignore reality. The reality is, if you, are, if you are not mature in Christ, you will be. You, you will be an infant. Now, there's, there's not an understanding here that uh, in, the, in the imagery that he's giving, that somehow uh, in our physical world, we have a conception of uh, you, you grow up to be an, from an infant to being an adult man, and therefore you can stand up against any wave. No, go into the ocean, go into Lake Michigan, you get a nice, you know, three-foot wave, you're not standing, it's knocking you down. But the point here is that of uh, comparison. How able is a toddler to stand even in a small wave? As unsteady as they are, and you see them kind of wading in, and, and it can be just a lapping wave, and you see them kind of wobble, and they fall down. 
Paul says that's what it is like if you are not mature in Christ. If you're not growing, if you're, if you're not uh, attaining to what you have already in Christ Jesus. He says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro the waves, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and or by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. So the waves that he's addressing here are the things that are uh, of human teaching. Uh, we have the blessing and the grace of having the Bible for us in one cohesive unit, one book, being able to turn to certain passages, having an expounded revelation by the Spirit of God that the Ephesians did not have. And yet, how many in, how many church, a part of the body of Christ, especially in the West, finds itself being like infants, being tossed back and forth by some new teaching that comes along. Some new teaching that has been refuted by Scripture centuries before. And yet, because we are kind of doing our own thing, we, have, uh, we are taking on the minds of a toddler. So Paul is calling them to be planted, to, have be, to be grown into the maturity of the measure of the fullness of Christ. So really what Paul has in mind here is that it's anything against the doctrine of Christ. So it could be a direct teaching. There were plenty of teachings going around Ephesus that were mixing Judaism and uh, Roman uh, thought. There was philosophy that was coming in. There were, there were being attacked on multiple different sides. We are too. We have understandings in our own midst that says, I just will believe it and it will be so. If I just have enough faith, I can accomplish this task. And because I didn't accomplish this task, it must mean that I don't have enough faith. Or to say, I'm going to become a Christian so that I can be healthy and, and wealthy and, and have all the things that I ever want in this world. Those are false teachings. No, what, what God has revealed, and, and what, what Paul has in mind here, is the teaching of the apostles. That's where he's been in Ephesians up to this point as well. You need to remind yourselves of what the apostles have taught, what Jesus taught, about what we should then believe. And so the challenges are certain, but we need to increase our depth of knowledge. We need to be planted. This is, I, I believe, what the writer of the Hebrews, to the Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews, uh, says to us. And says, you desire, you should be eating meat by now, but you have to be brought along on spiritual milk still. You should be further along by how long you've been believers, but because you are fixated on these other things, these, these other controversies, these other things, as he writes to Timothy and Titus, to be wary about, uh, as Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, to be wary about. Those are the things that are tripping you up. You're taking all your attention off of Christ and putting them on things that are, don't lead you to Christ. That's what he means here. Your depth of knowledge uh, is required. Verse 13 that we've been highlighting, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, meaning that there's not multiple faiths, there's one faith. The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, it's important to note here, uh, even as we're talking about being planted, being planted is different to being entrenched. Okay, we need to understand this. The image here is really having an anchor. Uh, and we have this throughout all of our songs. Uh, will my anchor hold... Uh, all, all of these, these hymns that, that highlight the need for us to be anchored because we understand the waves of this world that can wash over us. Or perhaps um, it's, it's the, the, as we hear in the hymn, um, It is well with my soul, second verse. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, Still this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. That is where we need to live. 
Entrenchment looks like this. I've got it figured out. You're not going to convince me of anything else. My ears are closed off to you, and I will not engage with you. The difference is one of pride and dependence on self. Entrenchment says, I have it all under control myself. Being planted means I'm taking my sustenance from the Lord. He is the one that is growing me. He is the one that is holding me fast. He is the one that is encouraging me day by day in his word, by his spirit. And it's important for us to know that because if we are all approaching entrenchment instead of being planted, we will not be unified. We will not be, we will not be pursuing one Christ because when we are entrenched, that means that we do have it all figured out. We have the totality of the truth in our own thoughts and attitudes. And there's only one man who had that perfectly, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. All the rest of us stand under and have to be willing and humble ourselves under the Word of God to be corrected, to be encouraged, but to also be rebuked by it. And so encouragement here is using the means of encouragement. It's the word of God. It's pointing us, everybody to Christ. Be planted in Christ. So this is our encouragement to one another. The goal of your encouragement to your brothers and sisters in Christ is to point them to Christ. It's to, that they would be planted in the fullness of the measure, the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So when you seek to encourage one another, it, it, it doesn't have to always be this way. Uh, this is not a call to say that if you encourage somebody uh, as they walk out of the building this morning and they fall down and skin their knee, you say, well, just continue on into the fullness of the measure of Christ. Well, okay, that, that should be there, but really that should be the underneath goal. Why do you go up to them and care for them in their need of skinning a knee? Because you care for them. They're, they're an image bearer. That would be something that we would do to anybody, whether they profess Christ or not. But why do you, but does it stop there with that person that is out there with the skin knee? No. Because the goal for you in encouraging a brother and sister in Christ is that they would continue on. That's what we see in the next goal. Progress. Verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way, into him who is the head, into Christ. Uh, th there are probably not too many uh, OPC um, sermons going on this morning that are calling God's people to be progressive. But I'm not talking about that kind of progressive. We are to progress. We are to grow up. And Paul calls them to it. Paul calls us to it. The goal of us as, as being bought by Christ is so that we would look more like Christ. The, the operative word there is more, meaning that we don't look like him fully right now, meaning that as long as we are in this world, we will never completely, utterly, fully look like Christ. But we should grow closer to him. Somebody looking at us and painting a picture of, of who we are should paint a picture of one that is more like Christ five years from now than one that is right now. So what, what does Paul say here? You need to progress, but it occurs through speech. Uh, the word that he uses here is really speak, uh, a truth speaking. So it's an understanding that the nature of what you are speaking is truth. It's not that you're sure talking and truth is included, but that everything that you're saying is true. Now, in order for you to know that it's true, you have to match it up to the ruler, the word of God, the truth with a capital T. So it occurs through speech. Now, now Paul has already gotten to, and so for those that are saying, yes, we, but, but what, do we, what do we do if we just go around talking about faith? Shouldn't we be doing as well? Well, Paul has already addressed that in Ephesians. And so we have that in context uh, back in verse 12. 
um, that, that's how he builds us up, through these acts of works of service that we are engaging with one another in the body of Christ. So it occurs through speech, but love is required. There, there is no separation here. Paul gives no wiggle room. Paul does not say, you know what, do your truth speaking, um, and at times, you know, if, it, if it's okay, if it, if it seems to fit, or if you seem to think about it, do it in love. No, this is all part and parcel of one action. It's coming at and speaking the truth, speaking God's word in love. And so what does that look like for us? Well, Paul gives us an image later on in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, he says, as you're encouraging one another, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So we've already done that this morning. We have been truth speaking to one another in love as we have sung the songs that we have sung this morning. That's why we take it seriously here that we don't just sing any song that might have a catchy tune, that might have something to do with a spiritual sense of something, because we care that the words are carrying the message. Does this match up to the truth? Well, we also speak to one another when we encourage one another, when we actually talk to one another, when we share the truth with one another. Uh, I believe, and this is just maybe uh, an, a, a picture of my own mind, uh, which, is, which is maybe not helpful, but I picture here uh, that many of us within the church think of speaking the truth in love as having those really hard conversations. You know what, I just need to get down there in tough love. You know, they're going astray, but I just got just to speak the truth in love. And that's where it ends. What about the times when we come alongside and say, praise God that he exhibits himself in a man and a woman being brought together in marriage. And this is a picture of Christ in the church. This is awesome. This is wonderful. God bless you. That's speaking the truth in love. We need to be careful, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we do not make so much effort in rooting out uh, the, the things that are, are, are bad and, and negative, pulling the weeds around us, that we miss the clear and present opportunities for us to speak words of truth, dripping with grace, love, affection to one another. That's what Christ did. Certainly he spoke and he got in the faces of those that were abusing the truth. But he also bound up the brokenhearted. And so we need to be in each other's lives, being truth speakers that are connected by love, that even the very words, that they would have to work really hard to say that you were not speaking in love because it would be so obvious and so clear. Now, you know, you might ask, okay, so then what kind of words do I use? Give me a list of words that, that I can pick from that will then communicate this love to my brother and sister in Christ. Well, I, I have a list of words for you. They're the same words that you can come at them and they don't know that you love them. No, the words that we use as we speak the truth are certainly from God's word, but we know when somebody has a motivation to care and love for us. So we need to progress through our speech and encourage one another, but it also involves whole growth. This is what we see when, when he says we will uh, grow up to become every, in every way or will grow to become every, in every respect. So this is a picture of all of these different parts being grown up. All of these parts being built up so that uh, we will be together in this. Uh, notice that when we, when we grow up in this process, who's included in the we? Every single one of the body of Christ. Notice too that Paul includes himself. 
Paul recognizes his own role in the body. He recognizes his own need to grow. He recognizes his own need to become more like Christ. Here's the thing. We're not there yet. If you are considering that you have arrived, then you really need to be careful. You need to really dig into 1 Corinthians. Uh, this is the same word that Paul uses in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians, where, where he says that I planted and Apollos watered, but who gave the growth? God did. The whole growth here is that it is pointing to the reality that we need to encourage one another, but God is the one who is growing. Now, this is very challenging. Any kind of growing is challenging. It gets harder to grow as you get older. Now, I say that with a caveat. Uh, it is actually easier to grow as you get older but not in the ways that you want to. That's another topic for another story. This isn't health class. What are we supposed to grow in then? Uh, this, is, this is not something where, we, where we've got to get to a certain point and when we've arrived and we kind of stay there. No, we are supposed to be growing in knowledge, in unity, and maturity. That's what Paul is calling the church to. And he includes himself in that. So here, here's what it is. Kids. Uh, teenagers, your parents have a desire for you to grow. And so they, they feed you good food. They give you opportunities to, to exercise and to, and to enjoy life and to learn and, and to teach you things. Because their desire is that you would grow up. If we encouraged, uh, and we do, encourage toddlers at their first step, right? Very precious thing. Seeing a little baby taking a few steps, kind of tumbling over, and we say, yay, that was a great job, good first step. Uh, what happens when she's nine and she's still just kind of taking that first step and then stumbling over? Well, we say there is something wrong here. She, she should have grown up by now. Uh, what happens uh, when, when he um, says, for, you know, knows his letters and it's really, really encouraging as a parent or a grandparent. You say, oh, it's so great. Let me show you this, this video of, of my, my, my grandson and he's going to tell you the letters. He's 25. No, we say something is wrong. We say this is not what it should be because we understand a certain aspect of growth. That's what Paul is calling the Ephesians 2, a, 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 a whole growth, being taught, being brought up. Why? Because it's a clear direction. That's where, what Paul says in verse 15. There's a clear direction here of growing, not just up in any way that you want. That, that's what our world would say. Grow up, pick a goal that you want to grow up to. Follow after that. Hit your wagon to that star and go for it. You can do this. No, what does Paul say? Paul says that you would grow up in every way into him who is the head. That's Christ. So we, as a, as a body of Christ, the picture here that, that he continues to unpack is this, this body image where we are individuals, a part of the body of Christ, meaning that we are inseparable from one another. You cannot take a foot off the body and say there are two different bodies there. No, the foot is a part of the body. And so you and I, as confessing believers in Jesus Christ, are part of one body. But it's not just you and I here at New Hope. It's you and I and all of those that the Holy Spirit has regenerated all around the world. We are part of the body of Christ. And we all are called to a clear direction. A clear direction of Christ. A clear direction of growing up into who Christ is. Now, earlier I asked you what the chief end of man was. And I could go along and, and say as well, who has attained that? And none of us can say we have. None of us can say we have glorified God and enjoyed him forever. 
But there is one. There is one who can say, I have glorified God and enjoyed him forever. And that is the one that Paul expounds upon, the one that has come from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The one who has made a way where there was no way. The one who came and lived a perfect life, glorifying God in every single action, thought, behavior, word, while he walked this earth, exhibiting the righteousness that you and I do not have, the righteousness that we need in order to be with God. That's what Christ did. And so for anyone who believes, the scriptures say, you have the right to be called the child of God, a son or a daughter. Notice, this is a family image. We are not cousins, as I heard uh, a little while ago. That when we come to God, there are no cousins. There are no distant cousins that come and say, yeah, you know, we're kind of related over here. No, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And there is one head to that body, and it is Christ himself. There's a clear direction. We are charged to not go beyond that. We are charged not to ignore that. We are charged not to uh, deviate from that. But be encouraged because Christ has fulfilled that on your behalf. This is not a message to say you need to encourage one another because if you do not encourage your brother or sister in Christ, they are doomed. No, it is to say, look what Christ has done for you. Looking at Christ fully, can you honestly say that you don't want to encourage your brother and sister in Christ? So we need to progress. Lastly, we need to perform. Uh, the goal for, for believers is performing. And I do not mean this in a, uh, in a hollow way. We have come, this word has come into our, our understanding, sometimes within the church as well, to be a, an emptiness. Well, they're just performing. They're not really going through the motions. They're not really doing this. I intend this for us to understand this in the performance of what the New, Har New York Philharmonic does when they perform. There is weight, there is gravity, there is something meaningful that is happening as those bows goes, go against strings and as the wind is blown uh, through the oboes. We are called to our goal being performing, meaning that we all work together. So he says, from, from the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So this is according to plan. This is God's plan, uh, meaning that there's a certain way that things should go together. Uh, I did not take uh, any... Um, uh, I can show you that I, I didn't take it. Uh, anatomy class. So I can tell you I got bones. I can tell you somewhere in there, there's a, a femur. I think that's a bone. But I know the one who made me and knows how those bones go together. I know that God has put this body together. And if he is the one that has brought this body together, I can believe that he knows exactly how it's supposed to work. And he's not going to give us, make us guess, okay, let me try this and see if that works. Let me try this and see if that works. No, he's going to give us a clear direction of how we then should work together. And that's what he does in his word. And so this is, a, again, why we should be encouraging one another with the word of God, that we should be encouraged by the word of God. This is according to plan. This is how things work properly. Uh, literally, just, just for, for this, real quickly this morning, the word that is translated here as um, does its work in the NIV or working properly in the ESV is the same word that is used to describe the stature of the fullness of Christ back in 13. It's the measure. God has measured out the church. Not, not necessarily in that sense. But God knows exactly what the plan is. According to the measure of what it is, that's what it is. So this is according to plan. This is what we should be doing. We should be, our goal should be working the way that we were built to work. That's the, the capacity of what it's supposed to be, the measure of. 
from verse, back from verse 13 and verse 12 before that. But it's not just according to plan, it's a shared effort. So that's what Paul is highlighting here. We're, we're many parts put together. Um, there's joints and ligaments. Again, um, I, I think those, are, those things are there uh, in our bodies. You're going to have to talk to somebody who's medical or a doctor around here. Um, I don't like the sight of blood, so that's not me. But God has put us together. Notice how he's put, it to, put us together, though. He, he, very well, Paul could have used this image, imagery and said, listen, you guys get together, build yourself up, uh, kind, of, kind of get together, tool around, figure it out, um, and, and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll stumble across something. Uh, maybe you'll figure out how some things go together. No, he says, from the whole body joined and held together. So this is something that's happening outside of the body itself. Uh, the body, this is something acting on the body of Christ. The joints are being put together. Now ultimately, God is the one joining this together. God is the one who made the family of Christ. You did not pick your family, your biological family. You also do not get to pick the spiritual family of God. God births you into it. You've become born again into one family, the body of Christ. And so he has put us together. There are joints and there are ligaments, and they are working properly when we are being built up. But they're held together. So, so God has put you in a place next to your brother and sister in Christ so that you can be a joint. Things together, right? But you're also a ligament, holding together. But notice how this is characterized. This is a shared effort. How is this characterized? Again, we come back to love. Not only should we be speak, truth speaking in love, we need to be building each other up in love. We need to be seeing the body of Christ being built up and that being characterized by love. For that is what Jesus said, that you will know my disciples by their love. So three quick applications for us from this passage. One, seek maturity. Uh, originally I asked the question, do you want to be a grown up? I changed it to seek maturity. I didn't want somebody to be offended that I was telling you to grow up. But I'm telling you to grow up. Everyone here, myself first and foremost, seek maturity. You have not arrived yet. This is as individuals, but it's also for the church. So we should be identifying this and saying, yes, I want to I grow up. I want to be um, speaking the truth. I want to have the truth being spoken to me. I want to be uh, working uh, in the body. I want to, to be washed over with, uh, with what it is to be a part of the body. But we have to look at the church as well. Do you pray for the church? That th this church, particular, the local church, do you pray that we would grow in our maturity in Christ? Or is it just a foregone conclusion? Is it something that you just assume that's going to happen? Pray, seek maturity. Second, encourage towards Christ. This is, this is probably the biggest danger that I think that we have uh, in the church today, especially in 21st century America. Uh, we can read some encouraging little tidbits and say, oh, that was so encouraging, but we don't stop to ask why it was encouraging. Was it encouraging because we got a, a nice warm feeling of something comfortable and nice? Or was it encouraging because it highlighted an aspect of, of who Christ Jesus is? How he's revealed himself in his word? We need to be encouraging one another towards Christ. And it doesn't have to be, again, using those specific words. But that needs to be at the heart of what we're doing, encouraging. And finally, you need to love your family well. You need to love your, I could also say, you, could, you need to love your body well. Uh, there's a, a very high focus on uh, self-care in our culture today. Uh, but in the body of Christ, we need to love the family well. This is about our interactions. This is about bringing the concerns that we have to one another. This is about not allowing sin to fester. This is not allowing uh, things that are being done that are good to go unknown. Uh, this, this is all about loving the family well. We see that depicted in the Word of God from beginning to end. Since the beginning, encouragement has been part, uh, inextricably, 
from the human experience. There's always been encouragement. Whether it was at the Tower of Babel and, uh, and before the languages were, were, were dispersed and said, hey, that was a great job, great job putting that stone, we're almost to heaven. Or whether that is within today's People Republic of China, encouragement is a value. Make no mistake, encouragement is a, ba- a value. It will always be utilized to build and progress. The question as believers in, uh, and what we are called to is how are we fixing our eyes on the Savior and encouraging one another until we see him face to face? Then we will enjoy God and glorify him forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are good to us. We ask your grace upon us that we would be seeking the goal of this encouragement, that you would be glorified in it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.